Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Marielle Villaray, and I'm the Program Development Director for Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation at the CUNY Graduate Center. The Graduate Center is the postgraduate degree conferring institute within the City University of New York system, and our campus is located in Midtown Manhattan. I'm happy to welcome you to the Fridays at One speaker series, which is organized by members of our one of our popular non-degree programs, LP Squared, the lifelong peer learning program. LP Squared is a peer learning community of which admitted members teach and learn from each other in addition to organizing activities and special events for members and the wider community. Some of you in the audience have recently been admitted to join the program in January, so an early welcome to you. If you are retired or semi-retired looking to apply for fall 2024 entry, please visit our website and submit your contact details for updates on the information sessions we will hold in a few months. And our URL will be in the chat in just a moment. I'll now hand the virtual mic to LP Squared member, Linda Ansiding to introduce today's guest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marielle. Good afternoon and welcome to our Fridays at One, uh, sponsored by the Lifelong Peer Learning Program, as Marielle had just said. Um, about six times during the academic year, LP Squared offers these Fridays at One uh, speakers. Some of you might have heard our last two speakers of this semester, Geraldine Brooks and Stephen Vladek. Um, we have conversations with distinguished figures in the arts and sciences. These are public programs open to the CUNY community as well as the general public at no cost. We are delighted that you have joined us today. And it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Goodell, who is an author and journalist about one of the most important issues of our time, climate change. Jeff grew up in California, graduated from UC Berkeley and got his MFA from Columbia in uh, 1990. He has written about climate change and other environmental issues uh, since the early 2000s and culminating in his latest book, the New York Times bestseller, The Heat Will Kill Us First, Life and Death on a Scorched Planet. Uh, I wish you could autograph it for me, Jeff, but <laughs> it's a <laughs> time. Um, and uh, this is certainly a very timely focused book, given that 2023 is on record to be the hottest year uh, since keeping records, I guess. Um, Jeff brought his attention to energy and environmental issues in 2001, writing a cover story for the New York Times Magazine on the uh, US coal industry. His 2002 book, Our Story, was an account of nine miners trapped for 77 hours in a Pennsylvania coal mine, and it was a New York Times bestseller. His other books have included Big Coal, The Dirty Secret Behind America's Energy Future, how to Cool the Planet, Geoengineering, and the Audacious Quest to Fix Earth's Climate. And those were both um, important books. Um, and then The Water Will Come, Rising Seas, Sinking Cities, and the Remaking of the Civilized World was a New York Times critical choice top book in 2017. He's also the author of Sunnydale, a memoir about growing up in Silicon Valley, where his family had lived for four generations. Boy, the changes that they must have <laughs> gone through. A 2020 Guggenheim Fellow, Jeff has been a contributing editor at Rolling Stone since 1995, and he continues to appear on uh, many TV networks as an expert commentator on climate and energy issues. In its review of this of the book we'll be discussing today, um, the New York Times says that besides being a propulsive read, Jeff Goodell documents the lethal effects of rising temperatures and argues that we need to take hot weather a lot more seriously. So today, let's do that. And as we ask Jeff questions to help us better understand heat in the context of climate change. Well, we'll focus on the issues you address in the book, Jeff. I hope that we I expect that we'll also get to explore some of the latest climate news that's really been coming out every day this week. Uh, 
and I'm sure uh, people in the audience will have questions. We'll talk for about 40 to 50 minutes and then have time for a Q&A. So please put your questions in the question and answer section on the bottom menu bar. So you've written about environmental and energy issues for a while. Were there any pivotal events that motivated you to write about heat at this point? <laughs> Uh, yes, there was. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me, Linda. It's great. It's great to be here. And thank you all um, for joining us in this discussion. Um, yes, there was a very pivotal moment for me. Uh, I can tell you precisely when I decided to write about heat. Um, it was in July of 2019, and I was in Phoenix, Arizona, um, reporting um, a different story that had nothing to, to do with heat. I was staying downtown in a hotel and I had um, a meeting to get to that was about 20 blocks away. And I realized I was late. And so I decided that I was going to kind of run walk downtown um, to this meeting. And that was all good, except for the fact that it was 115 degrees. And so that means it was probably 130 degrees downtown where um, the heat of the asphalt and the sidewalks and everything amplifies heat. It's a well-known fact of, of, of urban life. And uh, by the time I ran, walked these 20 blocks, um, I was dizzy, my heart was pounding. And I realized if I had to go another 20 blocks, I would be in big trouble. And this might sound like an ordinary kind of um, uh, observation, and many of you maybe have had that, but for me, it was stunning, um, partly because I had, by that time, been a climate journalist for 15 years or so, and, of course, thought about heat all the time, talked about heat all the time. It's in the phrase global warming. It's not exactly a secret, but I had never really thought about what it can do to a human body and how dangerous it can be that quickly. And it was literally that day when I thought, wow, I don't understand heat at all. And I wonder if other people understand how dangerous heat, extreme heat can really be, that the book was born. It really, it really was a, a kind of aha moment for me um, that, that emerged right out of, of that experience. And, and, you know, I spent the next three or three and a half years uh, researching and reporting this book. Was there anything else that that um that we misunderstand about heat <laughs> that well we <clears throat> we misunderstand everything about heat um you know we we don't under, at least i didn't and um i think most people you know heat is a strange thing because we talk about it all the time right uh every time you get into an uber every time you greet somebody you talk about the weather is it hot for you is it not hot Every day you have to decide whether you're going to go out in shorts or whether you're going to put a sweater on or what you're going to do. Obviously, we think about weather and heat all of the time. It's, you know, it's, it's part of our life to such a degree that we don't even really think about how much we think about it. But heat is different than uh, um, other kind of climate effects, right? For first of all, heat is invisible, right? So when we have extreme heat events, I'm looking out the window right now. I can't tell looking out the window if it's 70 degrees out there or 120 degrees out there. If I were looking out the window and there was a hurricane blowing, it would be very obvious um, um, that it was, you know, the wind is blowing 100 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour or whatever. The trees would be bent in half. Roofs would be flying off of buildings. With heat, we have no psychological clues about it. And so it, it affects our, our, our kind of perception of it. And so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is we're not very good at kind of, um, we don't get messages very good from the media or from other people about the risks of heat, right? If you watch a newscast and they say, oh, it's going to be hot tomorrow, they might tell you the temperature, but then they'll also often accompany it with pictures of people at the beach or playing in a fountain, something like that. It's very like, oh, well, better beach weather tomorrow. Um, we don't have category risks, things like we do, say, again, with hurricanes, where we have a category one, category two, category three storm. We know what that means. There's no messaging like that um, around heat. 
And so we tend to think that it's, and then, and then we have air conditioning and we think lots of people have air conditioning and we think, oh, we have air conditioning. So we're, all, we're fine. And so as long as I have my air conditioning working and I don't go outside in the middle of the day, it's not a big deal. And so we tend to write off all of the profound consequences and risks of, of extreme heat. And that's what I really want to, wanted to explore in this book, both what it does to your body, what, what does a heat stroke really look like? What does it actually do to your physical body? Who is at risk for it more than others? Who's most vulnerable? And then that's the sort of personal scale. And then on the macro scale, I wanted to write about heat as the primary driving force of climate change, right? When we think about climate change and all of the impacts that we all read about in the paper every day, you mentioned that there's been a lot of news this week about melting ice sheets and things like that. All this stuff, more intense hurricanes, bigger wildfires, the orange skies you had in New York this summer, uh, you know, sea level rise, all this stuff is driven by rising heat. It's the primary driver of climate change. So this book looks at it from the very personal level, how heat can kill you very quickly, who's vulnerable, what you can do about it. And then on the very big global scale of how it drives all these other impacts. Yeah, thank you. And it, it, it's ironic, isn't it, that we always sort of want to go towards the heat. We want to go south when it's when it's warm. There. Well, it's true. I mean, people like warmer weather. I mean, you know, it's just I think, you know, I personally love cold and I've spent a lot of time in the Arctic and in Antarctica. And I'm uh, I, I find, you know, cold very uh, kind of appealing for some strange reason. But but, you know, I think most people, if they had a choice, they would choose to be in Miami rather than Duluth. Right. I mean, they prefer the idea of, um, you know, being able to wear less clothes, more outdoor activity, all these kinds of things. There's a reason why the South has boomed so much in, in the United States. And we've seen, you know, the fastest growing cities in the country are where I live in Austin, um, Phoenix, you know, Miami, places like that are really booming. And yet that we're reaching the kind of thermal limits of these places in ways that we can talk about. Yeah, I was going to say we can talk about the consequences of that. In your prologue, you talk about the Goldilocks zone, and um, it becomes a motif throughout your book. And I'd uh, like you to explain for us uh, what the Goldilocks zone is and why it's significant in your discussion of heat. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important thing to talk about. I'm glad you asked about it. Um, the Goldilocks zone is a phrase that... Um, uh, I learned from planetary scientists um, who I happened to be talking to uh, about how Earth climate regulates the temperature and the effects of water vapor and clouds and things and how it's different from other planets. And, and th this idea of a Goldilocks zone is the scientists who are looking out into the universe for life, signs of life, what they're really looking for is liquid water. That's, that's what they see as a sort of necessary enabler for life as we know it. And so in order for a planet to have liquid water on it, it has to be what they call in the Goldilocks zone, which is not too hot, not too cold, just right. If it's too cold, it's it, the water turns to ice. There's no life there. If it's too hot, it's Venus and all the water is evaporated away. So this phrase... Um, stuck with me and, and it's really a, a useful in thinking about the risks of, of extreme heat and of climate change more broadly because everything every living thing um us you and i and all of you who are listening and every lizard and every tree and every elephant and every cat has a goldilocks zone which is a range of temperatures that we are comfortable in and that Goldilocks zone is not random. It is a product of evolution. It is a product of the fact that we've evolved in a fairly stable climate for the last several hundred thousand years. There's been, yes, there's been ups and downs. There's been many ice ages. And in the long run of climate history, there's been wild swings. But we've evolved in a fairly um, stable time. And especially the last 10,000 years or so when civilization has evolved, um, it's been very stable. And so we've developed a ability to like thrive in this zone. And one of the biggest ideas in this book is that 
we are moving out of that Goldilocks zone. We are moving towards temperatures that are beyond what humans have evolved to deal with. And that is uh, an, an enormous risk, an enormous change. And it's not just humans, it's every living thing. And by the way, it's everything we built also. We built bridges and roads and runways and you know airplanes, everything to work in this range of temperatures that we've had pretty stable for the last you know 10,000 years. And now we're going beyond that. Mm, that's pretty, pretty significant. You know, one of the things I really appreciated about, about your book is um, your engaging and compelling storytelling, the personal, the, you know, on the personal level, um, as well as you're including a, a glossary for us lay readers, um, because you, you had to become so informed and you use vocabulary that many of us were not familiar with. Um, you, you, begin, you begin by telling the story of the Garish family in Cal Mariposa, California, and um, what happens to them on their walk. Um, and you also talk about global wet bulb temperature. I wonder if you could take us through what happens to them and also explain what, what global wet bulb temperature means in this context. Oh, okay, um, why don't I talk about um, wet, about wet bulb temperature first and I'll tell you about, about um, what happened to the Garish family. So there's various ways of, of measuring temperature, right? We all know this, there's temperature, air, dry air, just the air temperature. You know, if you listen to the weathercast, you also know about um, humidity, about that's the amount of moisture in the air. The heat index is a common thing that we hear about, which is which is which takes into account both the air temperature and the humidity levels. Um, but there's other factors that influence how our bodies you know, can dissipate heat and function in heat. Um, how much sunlight we're getting, direct, direct, you know, radiation from the sun. If you're sitting, everyone knows if you're sitting out on the sun on a hot day, it's a lot warmer than if you're sitting in the shade. How much wind there is, what kind of clothes you happen to be wearing, whether you're exercising or not. So without going into it in great detail, the wet bulb temperature is a, 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 um, an index that was designed actually by the US military because they're very, they do a lot of work on extreme heat because they're very concerned with their the soldiers um, working in hot, um, you know, uh, fighting in hot places and what that will do to them. So they've done some of the leading research on, on the effects on the human body. And the wet bulb index is a way of factoring all of these things in, wind, sunlight, temperature, humidity, and giving you a, 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 a ratings of what it actually feels like for your body. So, you know, an air temperature of 100 degrees, if it's very humid, and if you're, if it's, if it's very dry, it might have a wet bulb temperature that's relatively low, like 80 degrees. But if it's 100 degrees, and it's very humid, and you're out in the sun, and you're, you know, shoveling dirt, you might have a wet bulb temperature that is uh, 110 degrees or 120 degrees. So it's very different. It's a way, just a way of measuring with your body. So that said, that's that's one thing. So the you asked about the Garish family. So one of the things that I really wanted to communicate in this book is that the risks of extreme heat are not just to the guy working on the roof across the street or the person who is um, working on, you know, a uh, black asphalt uh, road, doing road work in the middle of the desert, or a farm worker, or, you know, a factory worker in a hot factory. Those people are, are certainly at risk, but it's also something that that is dangerous for all of us. And um, the story of the Garish family really illustrates that. They were, um, uh, they lived in California, uh, Jonathan Garish, 45 years old, was an engineer at Snapchat, a software uh, company in, in Silicon Valley. During the pandemic, they decided they wanted to get out of the valley. They were tired of it. They wanted to get closer to nature. So they moved up to Mariposa in the foothills of the Sierras, not far from um, Yosemite. And they started a new life up there and kind of were working remotely. And they were very outdoorsy. His, his wife, Ellen, was 30 years old. They had a one and a half year old child um, named Miju. And um, they would frequently go on hikes. And one day they decided to go on a 
seven mile hike uh, down a canyon into a river to the Merced River, and then hike up out of the canyon. Seven miles, they had done seven mile hikes before, um, you know, no big deal, except that it was um, a, a particularly hot day. It was 104 degrees. And, you know, that 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 was unusually hot for that area. And the night before their hike, Richard had a conversation with his brother, who was a, a kind of outward bound leader and very experienced in um, outdoor adventure, who said, you know, Jonathan, I heard it's going to be really hot there in California tomorrow. Are you sure you want to take this hike? And Jonathan said, yeah, 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 I know it's going to be hot, but we'll take water and we're going to leave early and we'll be fine. Well, they did take water the next morning and they did leave early with their daughter, uh, their one and a half year old daughter. He was carrying her on his back, one of those backpack, baby backpacks, and they had their dog with them. And then they left at 7.30 in the morning, hiked down to the river and everything was fine. We know later from their cell phones, they took selfies and things like that. And then at, they lingered at the river a, a, a bit long and around noon, they started to hike up. and they didn't perhaps realize it but the climb out was about two miles two and a half miles a very steep switchback trail coming up out of the canyon and crucially that area had been burned in a wildfire the year before so what had once been trees and forests was no longer forest there were so there was no shade there was just charred trunks so they started climbing up and exactly what happened um you know no one knows uh, i speculate about it in the book and you can read there but the short version of it is they didn't come home that night. The next day, their family and friends got worried, called the sheriff. Sheriff sent out a search party. Entire family was dead right on the trail. And it was a mystery because the sheriff was didn't understand what had happened. Families don't just drop dead on a hike. And they spent, it, it took actually six weeks of investigation. They first thought maybe it was some kind of terrible suicide pact. Then they thought maybe they had drank something in the water, that there was some kind of, you know, deadly algae or something in the water that they didn't understand. They worried about carbon monoxide release from an old mine nearby. It was none of those things. It, it, it was heat stroke. They all died of heat stroke, simul more or less simultaneously uh, on this climb out. Terrible tragedy. But I really wanted to tell the story in, in great detail because it's a really great example of how heat is dangerous to anyone, even people who are youngish, people who are in good shape, people who are aware of the fact that there's it's going to be a hot day and think they are taking precautions. Even for people like that, it can kill you very quickly. I mean, from the time they left the bottom of the river to the time they estimate they died, it was less than two hours. Um, and so I really wanted to open the book with that story because it seemed like a good way to communicate the, the risks of what I'm talking about in a, in a, in a broad way. Um, and, and, you know, I luckily for me had the blessing of the family to, to, to tell the story. They were very helpful to me and, and tell me some of the, de the details. And they really wanted the tragic deaths of, of their family members to have some meaning uh, and for people to learn from it. Yeah. Um... It certainly was an instructive story. Maybe if there's some kind of, uh, I mean, you write at the end about, and you said before, we don't have categories as we do for hurricanes. Maybe if there was some kind of rating system, it would have made a difference. I don't know. We can maybe talk about that. Yeah, I think, you know, it would have made a difference if they would have been more, you know, aware of the risks of heat. If they if they understood that heat can kill you quickly, if they understood you know, we tend to be kind of as I was on that my little you know my little walk uh, in Phoenix. I didn't even think about it. It's just I couldn't imagine that I could get in big trouble. And I, of course, I'm not comparing what I went through to what they went through. But you know, I'm sure that he thought they thought that they were going to be fine. And it was a little you know hike, um, a warm day. I think they didn't expect that the hillside was burned. They assumed there would be shade. But I'm sure that, you know, the idea that they were going to die of heat stroke was the last thing on their minds. That's why it's important to read your book. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, in addition to human victims, you certainly uh, also write about 
all living creatures and plants dying, animals affected. Um, can you give us one example perhaps of, um, you know, that we might not even think about in terms of the impact of heat on other living creatures? Sure, I can, um, there's, there's a number of things I can think about. I mean, one of the um, sort of most obvious and most kind of important in the big sense impacts is on food crops. Um, you know, corn and wheat are just like human beings. They have a thermal limit. And um, a lot of the wheat and corn, just in the United States, globally, it's the same issue. But just I focused uh, the, the agriculture part on the United States. You know, the corn that's growing in Iowa, um, the corn that's growing in Texas, major crops uh, are at their sort of thermal limits. And um, they, when temperatures spike, they they die um and one of the interesting and so the implications of this are enormous for our economy food prices what that means if we have you know diminishing crop production globally for food production obviously food production is hugely important and if the places where food grows well now is not where food will grow well in the very near future what are we going to do about that? And there's a lot of assumptions that like, oh, well, we'll just move the food north. We'll move the corn, the wheat, whatever crop you want to mention, north where it's cooler. And one of the things that I learned in my reporting is, of course, is that it's not that simple, right? A, a, a successful agriculture requires more than just the right temperature. It requires the right soil, the right rainfall, the right amount of light. There's many issues that go into this. So the, the idea that we're just going to sort of move uh, agricultural production to a cooler place is, is not going to happen. The second thing that is very, I was very naive about, and I think a lot of people assume is that because um, corn and other, you know, cereal crops and other food staples, everyone knows are sort of highly engineered. They, they, there's been tons of research on different varieties and genetic manipulation of, of uh, in some cases, of these crops. And there is an, I, there's an idea out there that, well, we can just sort of engineer new varieties, perhaps by genetic editing or by crossbreeding, to make corn that will grow fine in 130 degrees. And that essentially heat tolerance is like a trait, like blue eyes or something like that. And I learned that that is not true. And every geneticist that I talked to and every crop specialist I talked to said, we are not ever going to be able to sort of precisely engineer for heat. Heat is something that is deeply a part of the organism. Um, and that there's no simple genetic on off switch that we can turn up or turn down to make plants more tolerant. It doesn't mean that they eventually can't breed more tolerant plants and all that, but it's not simple and it's a, not a quick fix. So Agriculture production is, is, you know, a great idea. The tree outside your house, wherever you are, is another example of, you know, a living thing that has thermal limits. Here in Texas, um, you know, during the heat wave last, last summer, wasn't even anywhere near as extreme as this one, 10% uh, of the pecan trees in the, in the state died because the, it, we just got too hot for them. And this is the state tree that is, you know, used to being in Texas. So, you know, it, it, it affects everything. And um, some species are able to move to cooler places like, you know, frogs move higher up. There's lots of studies of, of animals moving to cooler places, frogs moving higher up the mountain, you know, fish swimming to cooler waters. There's species that are mobile that don't have barriers, things like that. There's a great, what uh, one climate writer calls a great rearrangement going on as animals and other living things seek out cooler places but that doesn't work so well if you're a pecan tree or or a coral reef um you know you can't just sort of pick up and move to a cooler place yeah talking about moving um animals one of the most unsettling chapters for me was the one about mosquitoes <laughs> and ticks um which i think many of us have you know, had personal encounters with Lyme disease is, is um, certainly almost epidemic around here. Um, uh, please talk about, 
you know, the the increase and in the, the movement of mosquitoes, migration of mosquitoes and, and other insects. Um, gently, please, because it really, <laughs> really gets to me. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I lived in upstate New York for a while, and uh, I know the terror of um, finding a tick on you and or your child or, or someone and um, wondering, looking for that red ring and hoping that you don't have it. And, you know, the, the ticks are, to me and to many people, quite terrifying little creatures. And, and it turns out that they're exquisitely sensitive to temperature and, and, and moisture, but temperature also. And they're a great example of, you know, an animal that seeks out its Goldilocks zone that will move as the temperatures move. And that's why, you know, um, everyone in the Northeast who thinks about Lyme disease knows is, you know, it started in Connecticut and and in, you know, the lower parts of, of the Northeast and has now moved up almost or probably now to the Canadian border. And it's because of this sort of warming that has allowed these incredibly sensitive um, creatures to move into new zones. And when they move into new zones, they bring things with them that we don't like, like the microbes that, that cause Lyme disease. And the same thing is true with mosquitoes. Um, another um, uh, animal that carries these vector-borne diseases, as they're called. And they're, as everyone knows, highly mobile. Um, there's no barrier that's going to stop a mosquito, obviously, I mean, a screen or something like that, but it does not have kind of natural barriers they replicate very quickly, they can move very fast um, from region to region. And uh, we're seeing that happen all over the world. And the implications are um, to, for public health uh, are enormous. Um, you know, people think, what's the most deadly animal in the world? And, you know, if you ask most people that, they'll think about great white sharks, or they'll think about, and you know, they might say grizzly bear, or they might say, you know, uh, rattlesnakes or cobra or something, by far the most dangerous animal is, that kills more people by far than anything else is mosquitoes. Over a million people a year die um, from mosquitoes. And so what they bring with them as they move have huge consequences, um, not just fatal um, diseases um, like malaria, which is you know very prevalent in parts of Africa right now and has been for a long time. And as Africa warms and temperatures change there in the same way that they're doing everywhere else, these malaria carrying mosquitoes are moving into new regions of Africa, um, causing, you know, enormous suffering and, and death. Um, we're seeing even seeing malaria emerge in the US for the first time. Uh, we've seen cases the first time in decades, obviously, we had it here before, but it was more or less eradicated. It's coming back. Um, they found cases even as far north as Delaware um, in the last year. Um, but also, you know, diseases that are less fatal, but no fun, like Zika, dengue fever, things like that. And mosquitoes, you know, are, um, you know, they're just, they're exquisitely sensitive. And so they're one of the kind of, when we think about rising heat, it's not just about, you know, going outside and, you know, risking your life in a direct way because you're going for a hike on a hot day or you're playing tennis or you're going for a walk or putting a new roof on your house or whatever. Um, it, it's also these sort of secondary effects, which are the, the rising of diseases caused by the movement of animals, the food shortages in, and changes in food production as a result of crop failures, uh, as a result of rising heat. So it has all these sort of knock-on effects that are really important to, to think about. Yeah, one of your stories was about this Florida woman who contracted uh, dengue fever from a mosquito, I know. Um, what, just quickly, what about those pine bark beetles. You write that uh, their appetites can change the world. Where are they and, and what, what do they do? <laughs> well, pine bark beetles are, um, uh, first of all, just to like, you know, uh, they, they, they don't have anything to do with us. They don't, they don't, they, they don't, you know, crawl into your bed at night and do anything to us. So there's nothing to worry about from a sort of like, 
they're not a version of a tick or anything like that. Uh, they are a, um, a beetle that preys on pine bark, as the name would suggest. Um, they're prevalent. Um, the the you know the biggest infestation of them and the, the place where it's most relevant to this discussion is in the West, in the Rockies, in in Vancouver, British Columbia, places like that, where you have these enormous pine forests. And like mosquitoes and ticks that we talked about, they are enormously um, temperature sensitive. And um, they, w the hotter it gets, also the more kind of revved up they get, the, the more it increases their metabolism. It increases our metabolism too. When we get hot, our heart beats faster and, and our metabolism moves faster. And that's what generates the internal heat that we have to dissipate. But this is also true of pine bark beetles and they get basically way more active and way more hungry. And what they do is they prey on the bark of pine trees, which might not sound like a big deal, except that these pine trees are also stressed by the heat and heat, uh, as everyone knows, causes evaporation and that evaporation dries out forests. And so these trees are water stressed at the same time as they're heat stressed. And then along comes the pine bark beetles that, that take these weakened trees and begin eating, the, literally eating the bark off of them. And that is then um, bad enough and it causes major die-offs and it has caused major die-offs in Colorado, in Montana, in British Columbia, places like that. Um, but then the added kind of um, complexity uh, and the kind of what we call cascading consequences uh, of climate change and of extreme heat is that then you have these dead, dry forests that have been kind of killed off by these marauding swarms of pine bark beetles that are then sparked into wildfires. And so it increases the risk of wildfire enormously. And so, and then when they do catch fire, uh, whether it's through natural causes like lightning or whether it's because a chainsaw spark or whatever it is, um, then they burn bigger, they burn longer and they burn more intensely. And, you know, that is all implicated in the orange skies that you had in New York on the whole East Coast this summer. Yeah, that's, you know, um, you also write a lot about the urban heat islands and uh, you talked about Phoenix, of course, but um, you, you devote a whole chapter to Paris when, you know, um, what are some of the most critical heat islands and, and why, you know, what about Paris, which we always think of as one of the most beautiful cities in the world? Is that a particular mm -hmm. dangerous he urban heat island? Yeah, well, first of all, I would say that Paris is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I totally love Paris, um, and it was fun to write about it because I, I love it so much. Um, so, uh, you know, an urban heat island is not... Um, I mean, basically every city is an urban heat island, some worse than others, but um, it, it's a very simple idea um, that I think all of us can intuitively understand. You know, um, when you uh, go for a walk, you've all, everyone I'm sure listening to this has been outdoors on a hot day, barefoot perhaps, and stepped on like the sidewalk and the sidewalk is really hot or on the street or picked up a rock that was hot or or even another example is you go to your car on a hot day and the steering wheel is is hot and you can't touch your steering wheel. It happens to me in Texas all the time. I have to sit there and wait for my steering wheel to cool off before I can drive because it is too hot to touch. So materials absorb heat and then they get hotter just like a rock does in a fire or something like that. So just think of cities as these sort of big heat absorption devices. They're made of concrete, they're made of asphalt, they're made of steel, they're made of glass. All of these things absorb heat and then kind of radiate it back in the same way that, you know, when you step on, on a, a hot sidewalk, you feel that heat radiating up. So it makes cities hotter than other places and uh, than the surrounding area. Usually it's depending on the city and the place, it's usually a, about seven to 10, even 12, sometimes even 15 degrees hotter. So one of the big things in thinking about um, how to deal with heat is how to think differently about how we build cities, how to include shade trees, green space, access to cooling spaces, all kinds of things like that. And so I talk about Paris because Paris is a city that, you know, 
has had a history of extreme um, heat waves and a history of it's very vulnerable to to um, these climate driven heat waves. And it's a place that that unlike Texas, where people kind of understand heat and they have air conditioning if they you know many people do some people don't we can talk about the have and have nots of air conditioning if you would like and that's a really important subject but you know we understand in texas and in other hot places sort of how to deal with heat in in paris where they are what's what one friend of mine uh, that i was taught reporting with on this book talks about their their heat their their climate stupid they don't understand they're not used to dealing with extreme heat so nothing is air conditioned and the arch very architecture of the city with these garret roofs in, in the especially in the old part of the town of anyone of the city if anyone has been there i've seen them they're very famous kind of tin roof these garret uh 18th century garret um uh, buildings they just sort of magnify the heat even more and so and I write about a, a heat wave in Paris in 2003, where 15,000 people died. And I write about some very vivid examples of, of what happened to these people and why so many people died in the city. But because of all this, and because they have a, a, a mayor who is um, understands all this very much and is very kind of progressive on all climate things, you know, Paris is undergoing a radical transformation right now. Uh, they are doing amazing things in order to think about how to make Paris a city that is suitable for what's coming in the 21st century. And so let's start with things like cleaning up the Seine so that you can swim in the Seine now in many places. It, you know, fun recreational thing, but also hugely important as a place to kind of cool off for people who need to cool off and may not and who don't have air conditioning they're they're banning um vehicles internal combustion engines from lots of the inner part of the city in order to make the city more walkable but also to you know reduce co2 pollution and to reduce um, air pollution in, in the city which is exacerbated uh, by heat they are using these closing up some of these roads and planting them with greenery. They're trying to get way more of nature in back into the city. Uh, shade trees, all kinds of walking areas that give people respite from, from the heat. Um, they're really kind of, the, the mayor talks about, you know, um, bringing nature back into Paris. And I think of all the cities in the world that I'm aware of, they're the farthest along in beginning to rethink what a city needs to look like to thrive in in what's with what's coming um, um yeah i'd like to talk about some other hopeful thing signs but um you know you certainly had to be have to be very informed about the science of climate and you introduce us to a number of scientists uh, you call climate heroes um climate science heroes. Could you give us an example of one person who you think is really doing um, important work in this area of climate science? Sure. One of the scientists that I um, basically spend a whole chapter writing about is a, a woman named Frederica Otto, um, who is a, a, a German scientist who now lives in um, London and, and works in London. Um, and she's doing something called attribution science. Um, so, you know, the, the basic science of climate change is very straightforward, right? We have known that, you know, CO2 is a heat trapping gas um, since, you know, the 1870s. We have known that, you know, fossil, f you know, fossil fuel re releases CO2 similarly for uh, more than 100 years. None of the sort of basic ideas of uh of climate change of the greenhouse effect as it's known is is at all new nor is it at all controversial to, in any unless you consider like the science of gravity controversial i mean it's very straightforward so the complexity in the science world is not so much with that it's with okay, at a certain, with a certain level of rising CO2 in the atmosphere, what are the effects of that? 
how does the ecosystem, how does our world, both our hum human world and the natural world, react to this increasing warmth? And what are the implications? How fast do the do the glaciers melt? What happens to um, you know crops? What happens to living things? I mean, all of these kinds of things we're talking about. It's about this sort of sensitivity as they talk about it. But Frederica Otto, Freddie Otto uh, is is doing something really interesting, which is um, this what's called attribution science, which is trying to understand more precisely when an event happens. So like I write extensively about the heat wave in the Pacific Northwest in 2021 that killed a thousand people in the, it was in sort of the Oregon, Washington, British Columbia area in British Columbia, where I would always talk when people would always ask me before that, you know, where do you go for a safe place in the world of climate change? And I, I would always say, there's no place that's immune, you know, that you, you, you can't, you know, go to, uh, there's no bubble that you can move to that will protect you entirely, but there are better and worse places. And one of the better places is British Columbia, because there's a lot of water, there's a lot of greenery, it's a relatively cool climate, all that. Well, British Columbia got to 121 degrees and towns were basically spontaneously combusting. It, it was so hot and they were so unprepared for it. So um, Freddie Otto and her team looked at that event at, right afterwards. And, and and she's trying to figure out, okay, is this a natural event? Or is, you know, as people always say, of course, there's always been heat waves. Of course, there's always been hurricanes. Of course, there's always been droughts. But we know now, the scientists have previously been saying, well, as the planet warms up and we put more CO2 in the atmosphere, these events are more likely, but they would never ascribe a particular event to say, okay, that was caused by climate change. Well, Freddie and her team has figured out by using highly sophisticated models that have been vetted by many scientists, how to attribute particular events to climate change. So after the 2021 heat wave in the Pacific Northwest, she was able to say within a month afterwards, her and her team were able to say that event would have been impossible in a world without higher CO2 levels. In other words, if we hadn't loaded the atmosphere with CO2 from burning fossil fuels for 150 years, she was able to attribute that event and say this was caused by climate change. And what's interesting about this is that a couple of things. One is that she doesn't, I mean, they, they do many events um, and, and many, some events, she says that their models show weren't caused by climate change. So that, for example, there was a really bad flooding in Pakistan last year that was very serious um, from extreme rainfall um, that lasted five or six days. And in and, and the media was kind of covered like it was driven by climate change, but her modeling suggested, no, this was within the range of natural variability. And our models show that this could have happened in a world with lower CO2. But what's really interesting about this is so it's being able, it's it's sort of proving the connection. And then it's also opening the doors to thinking differently about responsibility for this and in even litigation. And that's a whole other thing we can go into, but it begins to make the fossil fuel industries look a lot like the tobacco industry in the sense that they've known for a long time what the effects of this are. The, you know, they have encouraged the use of this product. And now we can say, just as doctors could say when my father died of lung cancer, you know, the link between his smoking five, three packs of cigarettes for too many years and that lung cancer was very well established medically. Well, Freddie Otto is doing the same thing with fossil fuels and these climate events. Yeah, that is really exciting science. And just this week, I think you also, um, you had talked about in your book, the NASA scientist, James Hansen, who just came out with this big paper about uh, global warming and uh, it's causing some controversy. Maybe in the Q&A, we can talk about that. I just um, want to get to people do have questions. Um, two more things. One is uh, you went on so many adventures around the world for this book. Could you just point to, to it quickly one of the ones that was the most exciting and enlightening for you in terms of well, I could talk about my trip to Antarctica, which was um, I went to Antarctica for two months um, uh, to look at the uh, how 
changes in temperature of the Southern Ocean are affecting the ice melt in on these enormous glaciers in Antarctica. And that was an amazing trip for all kinds of reasons. But you asked me most exciting, and I think the most exciting in a terrifying, exciting kind of way was um, a trip to a similarly cold place, except this time in the Arctic, a place called Baffin Island, where I went on a um, six week uh, cross country ski trip with two other, with two friends, um, where we camped on the ice um, uh, every night, skied along the uh, edge of the of the of the island, and Baffin Island is um, notable because first of all it's very beautiful, and it's far north in, in the northwest or northeast territories of of Canada, kind of right across from from Greenland. Um, it's got the highest density of polar bear population in the world. And I won't go through all the details. You can read it in the book. But um, one of the things we were looking for was, we were looking at was how this melting ice is impacting the polar bear population. And, you know, polar bears hunt on what's called the ice flow, the, the, where, where the, um, they can kind of stand on the ice and, scoop the their their meal is seals and they use their front paws to scoop the seals out of their um uh, breathing holes or from from the edge of the ice with, as they kind of swim by and um as the ice melts and retreats polar bears go hungry um because they don't have access to their hunting grounds because there's less and less ice and the season is shorter and shorter and they have to eat a lot get really fat and then they go hibernate if they don't get the lung get really fat they die so we were that's we were up there kind of looking at that and among other things and the most you know uh you can again i won't go into the whole story of, in this but at the on the very last day of the six-week trip we were camping on the ice and we had this wire that went around our tent that was supposed to be a bear alarm because if the bear came near our tent it would break this wire and alarm would go off it had gone off many times on our trip it was always wind and, and at the end of the trip it went off uh, I was in the tent with my friends. We thought, oh, the wind just blew the wire down again. I'll go fix it, I said. And I opened that tent, and there was a polar bear charging our tent. Um, it was, uh, you know, hungry. And she had two two cubs with her, and um, she was about 20 feet from the tent, coming in with full intention of um, eating us like hot dogs on the ice. Um uh, that day and I jumped out of the tent and she stopped and stood up on her back legs and we had a um, eye to eye encounter shall we say that was um, not just exciting and terrifying um, and it, I read about it at the end of the book but it was a profound example of you know this connection between as our world changes how you know animals are just like us they're they're looking for they have to think differently about how they live and so she was hungry she saw these things sleeping out on the or laying out on the ice smelled like meat to her and so i was going to be her meal um and luckily uh she changed her mind at the last minute yeah one last question but i see we have a number of questions um did you have um a discovery um or is there something that we haven't discussed that you would like us to know about and we haven't talked about that you think is really important for us to to know about? Um, well, I think what, you know, one of the big picture things in just in just thinking about heat and climate change that I think a lot of people don't really grasp. And I think it's just a fundamental idea that I, I like to repeat because I I, I think that to understand the bigger picture that we're talking about here is really important is that you know everyone you know climate change extreme heat is caused by burning fossil fuels 75% 80% depending on what country you're talking about of man made co2 is from fossil fuels and that that co2 goes into the atmosphere and it's different than of regular pollution so everyone sometimes people call climate change an environmental problem and it is in some ways but it's very different than like smog or air pollution or something because smog and air pollution goes away once you stop putting it into the air they put catalytic converters on cars air got a lot cleaner what's happening 
with climate change and burning fossil fuels is the CO2 goes into the atmosphere and it's up there essentially forever for all intents and purposes, hundreds, thousands of years. From a human point of view, it's up there forever. So what's really important to grasp is that even if we, somebody, you know, waved a magic wand and we all stopped and all fossil fuel burning stopped tomorrow and everybody rode skateboards and, you know, whatever, um, the warming would not go away. We would still be at the level we're at now and we would stay at this level for hundreds, if not thousands of years until we could figure out a way to pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere or these natural processes take over. So that's a really important idea because it really means that the climate that we all grew up in is gone and we're living in a different world now and we're not going back to the old world, no matter how activated and motivated we are. It doesn't mean that activation and motivating, cutting CO2 and all that kind of stuff isn't really important. It is because it limits the extremity of this stuff. But I think a lot of people think that climate change is sort of like a broken leg or something that like, oh, we just got to do the right thing for a little while and then it'll all, we can all go back to normal. That's not what's happening. We are moving into a new climate era and our world is poorly designed for that. Okay, um, we'll have to talk about that machine that's um, first operational machine to suck yeah. the CO2 out of the air is, was made operational this week in California. So yeah. maybe, well, let's talk about that. But first, let me um, get to some of our uh, members' questions. Um, Ber Bernie Belkin uh, asked, you've talked about the movement of various species to adapt to the warming climate. Can you talk a little about the migration of human populations, the scope, size, and specific places? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, humans are just like, uh, you know, that's what traditionally, you know, in the eras before uh, air conditioning and things like that. And, and you know, we moved as the climate changed. Um, it was the melting of the glaciers that allowed humans to cross over uh, the Bering Strait and come into North America. You know, humans have always migrated with um, the changing temperatures and with, you know, um, food and access to water and all kinds of things that, that go with that. And, you know, we're seeing that happen right now, right? We're seeing migration moving out of hotter and hotter places. Um, Central America, a lot of, you know, no one can say specifically like at least no one that i'm aware of has good numbers on when you have think about the migration that's coming up in the southern border that is coming out of south america and up out of um central america you know guatemala mexico places like that a lot of that is driven by political strife and economic issues but a lot of it is also dri driven by climate issues by um and the way climate stuff amplifies these other things like the food failures and things that I was talking about. In the book, I write about a, a farm worker who died of a heat stroke in Oregon, who was from um, Guatemala and was a, um, had, had come up. Um, he was looking for a job, um, but he was also looking for a better place to live. And so, you know, we see people moving that way in, in the Mediterranean. We see people moving that way, uh, moving in Africa. Places in Pakistan, I write about Pakistan in, in the book, a very volatile place um, where they have some of the most extreme heat waves on the planet and by all accounts will be some of the first areas to be, you know, kind of more or less uninhabitable without, you know, um, access to air conditioning and cooling of some sort. And of course, the problem with my with human migration is that, you know, mosquitoes come with their diseases, humans don't necessarily come with diseases although they sometimes do but you know they come with complicated politics not they themselves but they're they create you know i live in texas there's no issue that is more front and center of every con political conversation in our state than what are we doing about the border what are we doing about the border the, you know same thing in the u.s in the national political conversation trump is all about the border build the wall build the wall build the wall and so this idea of who do we keep out, who do we let in, is all going to be driven um, to an extreme by changing climates. You know, I spent a lot of time in Australia, for example, um, 
there uh, a lot of islands in the Pacific there, not so far from Australia, where they're going under uh, because of the rising seas and they need refuge and they need to go somewhere. And so where are they going to go and who is going to take care of them and what does that mean? And it's driven by rising seas partly, which is heat related, but it's also driven by changes in the ocean temperature, which is driving their fish stock away into, into different places. It's all this human migration is a kind of recipe for political strife conflict and ultimately uh, war you 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 know in writing about the the immigrant uh, sebastian perez i think his name was the one who went yeah. to war that chapter is really also about you know heat being predatory the fact that um you write temperature is often a signifier of wealth class and race so you really get into that idea of you know the equity issues around this and i think it's really important for people to to read about and understand that. Yeah, it's, it, it is really important on multiple levels, you know, because, you know, if you have the money to have air conditioning, if, and even more importantly, that I discovered, you know, the money to run the air conditioner, that you don't care if you have a three or $400, $500 a month uh, electricity bill during the middle of summer, then, you know, you can think about heat and think that it is not a big deal. Um, but if you are living in a neighborhood where, you know, you're living in a poorly insulated house, uh, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, if um, you live on a street uh, where there's very little shade, very little trees, you know, the impacts are much starker and the risks are much higher. And, you know, I'm glad you used that phrase, uh, a predatory force. It is a phrase I use in the in the book. And it really does call, you know, call out the most vulnerable first. Um, and it and it's um, we, and I presume most of the people who are listening here live a kind of life that allows them access to air conditioning. And it's very easy to think, oh, what's the big deal? You know, we'll just turn up the air conditioning a little bit and we'll be okay. Well, you know, that's that's a very um, you know, there are billions of people on this planet who don't have air conditioning and for all intents and purposes, will never have air conditioning. You know, we're not gonna air condition the oceans. We're not gonna air condition the fields where the crops grow. Um, air conditioning is a kind of insulate, creates a sort of insulating bubble as well as a cooling bubble. Yeah, um, Debra, Debra Yaffe asks, um, we keep hearing that bees are dying off, but no one seems to know why. Can that be related to, to heat? Yeah, so I didn't really, I mean, there is a, a, a die off um, and uh, of bees and it's very concerning um, to people who um, look, who are looking into this and it's very, very concerning for food production and, you know, crop production because they're obviously really important pollinators. But I did not look at that in my book and I did not um, explore the nuances of that. Uh, I'm sure that heat is related to this, um, but whether it's related to um, the sort of body temperatures of the uh, bees themselves and the difficulty of keeping hives cooler, I do know, I mean, I, I do know that hives are amazing feats of um, thermal engineering and uh, that they're expertly designed for cooling and I actually was tempted to write about that in the book, but I, I just didn't. But it also could have to do with um, heat, um, uh, um, enabling and allowing bacterium and other um, infectious diseases essentially to thrive that are impacting these bee populations. So I have to say, I, I don't know the details of that. Um what initiatives do you recommend we support that address the best policies to um, um, for the issues of climate change and overheating the planet? Uh, there are certain things that uh, we can do. And I guess a related question along the same lines, maybe is um, Carolyn Setlow asks, as a parent and grandparent, I can't help but wonder what life will be like for my family long after I'm gone. Are you prepared to make any prediction about how many generations down the road will not survive the heat unless today we make some dramatic changes quickly as a society? And I guess the question is what changes 
should we be making? Well, um, you know, the frustrating thing about heat and about climate change in general is that we know the issues, we know how it works, we know the science, we know the physics, we have the technology, we have the tools to replace, you know, fossil fuel burning. We, even here in Texas, you know, fossil fuel capital of the world, third, we are number one in the country in solar and wind production, 30, 35% of the grid is solar and wind. And that's despite having a political leadership in the state that, you know, is pushing fossil fuels as hard as they can. So we have everything we need. We know how to engineer cities in different ways. We know how to build buildings that are better insulated, that are safer. We know how to um, send, you know, to, to we, we could talk much better about heat. We could talk about, you know, emergency heat warnings and things like that. We could build cooling shelters. None of this is you know, going to the to Mars kind of stuff where we just, oh, well, we'd love to go to Mars, but we don't have the rocket ships and we don't have the ability to, you know, um, get supplies and all, all the complexities of, of going to Mars. That is not what we're talking about here. We have everything. What we don't have is political leadership and political will. So the most important thing in thinking about this and doing anything about this is political leadership and in and is in getting political leaders whether you know it's on the city level the state level or the presidential level who care about this who think about this who make progress moving in these directions uh, that is where the answer is going to come it's not going to become from you recycling your bottles uh, those kinds of personal things are important but this is we need the sort of bigger levers of power to make this kind of change and you know frankly you know, if President, someone like President Trump gets elected again, I mean, you know, he thinks that climate change is a hoax, per, you know, perpetrated by the Chinese. I mean, that is the kind of thing that will doom us more than anything else. Um, and, you know, to be clear, this, I don't say that as some kind of partisan, you know, all the most important environmental legislation in our country has been passed by Republicans. You know, it, it was the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, all these things were passed by Republican administrations. You know, we had John McCain, who used to be one of the biggest climate champions in Congress, a Republican. It, it, it didn't used to be a partisan issue, but it has become that now. And, and just as far as like you asked about, you know, how many generations? I I do not. I am not a doomer. I do not think that unless we're really stupid and we um, do everything wrong, that climate change is an extinction event in any sense for human beings. I think that it is going to cause enormous changes and enormous loss, but it's also going to inspire a lot of great design, a lot of changes, a lot of rethinking about how we build our world. Just to add one last thing to this, people always ask me, Jeff, you've been writing about climate change for 20 years. You know, why are you not living in the basement, drinking bourbon and scrawling on the wall with crayons about, you know, the failure of human civilization? And it's because I find it incredibly inspiring. Every where I go on, especially on this book tour, I've been many, many places. I meet people who are doing incredibly interesting things, who are thinking about different ways to grow food, thinking about they have a new idea. Entrepreneurs have new ideas for some kind of energy efficiency or a cheaper, better solar panel or a different way of running the grid. Um, I meet, you know, kids on campuses who are act, who are organizing around this. I meet local politicians, national politicians who really care about this. There's a lot of you know, energy and inspiring thinking going on. And I really truly believe that we can use this crisis to do things differently and to build a better world. Thank you. I like hearing that. <laughs> um, Bob Meyer asked, uh, a few years ago, there was a book entitled Green Metropolis that argued for the urban setting as more conducive to the fight against climate change. But, there, but they are also heat islands, as, the, as you have discussed. Are we in New York making things better or worse? Huh. 
Well, uh, I don't think it's binary, but I think that, you know, cities are from a sort of big picture, um, much more efficient, you know, um, than sprawling landscape of suburbia, like we have all too much of here in Texas. Um, cities are compact. People, there's, you know, the, the density levels allow people to have neighborhoods much less dependent upon vehicles. And, you know, when you think about this in the big picture, preserving land for nature, um, for whether it's forests or whatever, is really important for the bigger picture of biodiversity and the sort of larger health of the planet. And so getting cities right is a really, really big part of thinking differently about climate change and thinking differently about how we live. And, you know, we could do a lot better job. There's a lot of things that we could do better that New York could do better. I, I talked about some of the things that Paris is doing. Um, New York could do a, a lot more. They could build more efficient buildings. They could change their building codes so that they're you know, more efficient. They could um, you know, increase access to uh, air conditioning and things like that in poorer neighborhoods. The issues of flooding in, in, in places like Red Hook um, and other parts of Brooklyn are a huge issue that, that needs more attention. There's a million things that cities can do better. And, and I think there's actually a lot of energy around that. I mean, I think there's a lot of thinking about how we can build cities better. The problem is, of course, is that, you know, it, it's not like we're starting from zero. They have a lot of built infrastructure in cities. And so it's how do you retrofit? How do you, how do you redo a place like New York so that it's more hospitable to this changing climate? Yeah. Um... We have uh, we have two questions related to water. We didn't really get to speak about. I remember the chapter called The Blob, which was like the title of a science fiction uh, movie um, where you talk about oceans and, and um, water rising. One, uh, Nancy Small asks, um, as we know, increased temperatures causing water levels to rise, but the Panama Canal is suffering Oops, uh, uh, suffering from drought. Could you explain? Yeah, well, the, the, the Panama Canal has been in the news because the Panama Canal is, you know, as everyone knows, a, a canal that has been dug between uh, uh, in 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 Panama that it, that is filled by fresh water that it runs off from the mountains and the surrounding area, and so as we've had a drought, as there's been a, decreased rainfall in that region, the water level has dropped and it's made the canal more difficult for passage for these ships. Um, sea level rise is a different thing. Sea level rise doesn't really have to do with rainfall and precipitation from fresh water. It has to do with the melting ice caps and the, the rising sea levels. And it's actually interesting that I don't actually know the nuances of the what's going on with the Panama Canal. That's just something that, you know, has just, you know, I, I heard about it for the first time when everybody else read the story in the in the Times or the Post or whatever it was um, these last weeks. So I don't know the nuances of, you know, how rising sea levels impact the um, the, the water levels in the, in the canals. But it, I, it's certainly clear that seas have not risen enough so that you can just sort of fill up the canal with seawater, right? There, there's a, um, the, the, the loss of the fresh water that is used to keep the canal full enough for these ships is much greater than the rise of the sea levels. And uh, Carolyn Setlow asks, uh, we read about the depletion of water in the underground reservoirs, um, the aquifers in parts of the country is this the result of climate change or simply human overusage? Apparently new construction is now restricted in Las Vegas because there's not enough water. Is this a very local problem or is it likely to spread more broadly? Well, it's both. I mean, a lot of the depletion of aquifers has to do with, um, you know, basically that we've pumped too much of it out, right? That we have through development and especially agriculture, um, you, you know, just pumped it as if these um, underground aquifers would go on forever. This is not a new problem. We've known about this for a very long time. There was a great book 
about it written in the late 80s, early 90s called Cadillac Desert that talked all, all about this. Um, so it's not new. What's new is that the development and pumping has continued, despite the fact that we know that these aquifers are um, limited. And also, as climb, one of the major effects of climate change is the shifting of rainfall patterns. So, and the tendency towards more extreme events, whether it's heat waves or droughts, or in fact, increased rainfall in some places. But um, this, these increased droughts have dried up a lot of these aquifers because the rainfall is less predictable. We've seen, uh, you've probably seen images of Lake Powell started to fill it back up again a little bit, but it was getting dangerously close um, to uh, being too low to run the hydroelectric power plants at the, at the big dam there. Um, so these changes in rainfall are a huge problem. And they, so these aquifers are not getting recharged in the same way that they were when we lived in a sort of more predictable climate and we weren't pumping huge amounts of water not just for agriculture in general but for growing sort of crops that are sort of frankly inappropriate for growing in regions where there's a limited water supply and i'm from california originally and you know growing almonds and rice in in what amounts to the you know the cent in the central valley which is one of a very dry region these are incredibly water intensive crops but farmers have a vested interest they've been growing it for a long time it's very difficult to get them to shift so you know when you think about the the problems of pumped out agri uh, uh, aquifers agriculture is really at the front of the list um i guess we have time for maybe one more question um you indicated that you're not a complete pessimist, but Thomas Hardy asks, um, are you pessimistic or optimistic about the impact of heat and technology in terms of the future? Um, heat and technology, meaning, um, I'm not quite sure how to take that question. Um, I'll, I'll just answer it. Um, so I, I, pres there, I presume that he means that how technology can help us deal with heat. Okay. So I'll, I'll I'll take it that way, unless um, unless you have another indication of it being a different way. And so I grew up in Silicon Valley. I knew Steve Jobs when he was running around barefoot, uh, you know, quoting Bob Dylan lyrics to everybody. I mean, I, I worked at Apple. I um, have a very strong belief in the power of technology to solve problems and to do better things technology of, is of course a double-edged sword there's all brings in as many problems in some ways as it fixes you know you can see that around everything from the you know internet to the current debates about ai and what that means and everything but i really do believe that you know we have the technology to solve all this stuff we can build look in the in the 12th century in the 10th century they were able to build extraordinary cities in the Middle East that thrived in really hot temperatures. But they, they did it because they understood how to engineer these cities. They understood, you know, that they should be, they, they didn't put black asphalt in, all around them. They were painted white. They understood how to engineer the, the cities so that they captured the, the breezes that came through. They understood how to shade from the sunlight. They understood in the in the seventh century, they knew in Iran how to make ice. They could make ice by circulating using these things called um, uh, wind towers that would capture wind and force it down underground over underground water that was cool and recycle it through there until that water was cooled to ice. So we know how to fix all of these problems. We know how to do this stuff. And technology is a major tool in helping us do it. The problem again is that we don't have the political will or in some cases, the cultural will. A lot of us are resistant to change. We don't want to do things differently. We want to live in the way that we've always lived. We want politicians to do things as they've always done. Climate change is going to require rethinking our lives, not necessarily sacrificing things, but just being open to thinking differently about how we live. And I think that technology is going to be and is a hugely powerful tool 
in in our ability to adapt to all of this and intelligently deploying technology is the thing that will save us. Yeah. Thank you. Are you going to be going to the UN climate talks in Dubai? <laughs> yeah, I, I've been to four of them now, I think. Um, and I'm the shorter answer is no, because I'm exhausted from the book tour and I have another book that I'm trying to get started on. Um, and uh, it's fascinating what's going on there. I, I would kind of like to go, um, but I'm not. Okay. Well, I think it looks like we're running at run out of time. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And a very special thank you, Jeff, for being part of our fall speaker series and for your um, really excellent discussion. Um, this is our last session this semester, but stay tuned. We have some really great speakers lined up for the spring, spring semester, and you will be receiving an email, which will invite you to register for our events, and we hope you will join us. We definitely appreciate your time and interest. It's been wonderful speaking with you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for joining us. This has been a great conversation. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.